Okay, we are now on to Pure Year 1, Chapter 13, which is integration, and we're only looking at functions of the form ax to the power of n. Trust me, when we get to Year 2 integration and we move away from these functions, it gets so much more complicated. So we're going to start off with some indefinite integration, and we're going to have a look at what's inside this blue box here. So my first learning tip is to think of integration as anti-differentiation. In fact, that's what integration was initially referred to as. And when asking to integrate something, we are asking ourselves, what differentiates to give? So we're actually trying to do the reverse process of differentiation. So if we're going to integrate ax to the power of n, if you think about what we normally used to do, we used to pull the power uh, we used to pull the power down and reduce the power by one. So reversing that, the first thing that we would do is we would increase the power by one, and instead of pulling the power down, we will be kind of putting the power. Um, we pull the power down, so we have to do that reverse process of having it to the front. We would have it as an a divided by n plus 1. And you can kind of see, if you differentiated this, how this would work. If we pull this power down, we would get a over n plus 1 multiplied by n plus 1, just to give us the a. And then we would reduce this power of 1 from power from n plus 1 just to an n. So we come up with this. And of course, there could be that constant at the end, which is plus c. So for fractional powers of n here, I pref prefer to think of this as increase the power by 1, and instead of dividing by the new power, I prefer to think of it as to multiply by the reciprocal of the new power. So that if this was fractional, instead of doing it as a divide by a fraction, it's easy just to think of it as multiplying by the reciprocal of that one. Now we can only integrate things if they are exactly in the form ax to the power of n, and be prepared, integration changes a lot in year 2. So let's dive in with these questions that we've got here. We're going to just go pretty speedily through these using this technique that you should all know from integration. So first of all, we have x squared. So that process is we will increase the power by 1, and then we divide by the new power. You could either write it like this, but the more common way is to write it with the third there. Now for our next part, we have x cubed. So I'm going to increase the power by 1, and we now need to divide by that new power, which is a 4. So we get a plus 3 over 4. And then for the 2 that we've got there, we're actually just going to have that as a 2x. It's actually like there's a 2x to the power of 0. So we're increasing the power by 1 and dividing by that new power, which is obviously just the same thing as 2x. And you'll start to notice anytime there's a constant, you can just whack on the x as well. And of course, for integration, we should finish off with this plus c, because if we were to differentiate this whole thing, this thing would disappear. So it's always a good idea to keep that constant in there as well. So we do need to write this in our standard form, first of all. This one and this one are not written in their standard form. So I'm going to be integrating y to the power of 2 fifths. Well, we know this is y to the power of a half, and it's in the denominator, so it would be to the power of a negative a half. So it's minus 3y to the power of minus a half. Sometimes people want to do something with this 4, but this is going to just stay as a minus 3 quarters, and then this y is going to be to the power of minus 2. So it's minus 3 quarters y to the power of minus 2, and we put that dx at the end there. So going through this process, I'm now going to increase this power by 1. You can either do it on a calculator, or you can just think 2 fifths plus 5 fifths is 7 fifths. And then do you remember I said, rather than dividing by this new power, you can just multiply by the reciprocal if it's a fraction. So we get 5 sevenths y to the power of 7 fifths. So I'm going to concentrate on the next part. We have y to the power of minus a half. I'm going to increase that by 1. Minus a half plus 1 is a half. And I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal of this, which is meaning I'm going to multiply this thing by 2. So we get minus 6. And for this one, I'm going to increase the power from a minus 2 to a minus 1. I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal of minus 1 or divide by minus 1, which just make it become a positive. And we get plus 3 quarters y to the minus 1 plus c, of course, at the end. Now, what you can do is you can differentiate your answer and this one here to check that it goes back to this one. And that's a really, really good technique to use. Very quickly, you can see 5 sevenths times 7 fifths will give us 1. And then we reduce the power by 1. You can check it here. The 6 and the half gives you the 3. The 3 quarters and the minus 1 gives you the minus 3 quarters. So you can always check these answers to c by differentiation. So this time we're going to do it with some function notation. It says given that f dash x is equal to this thing, and that f of 1 is 5 sevenths, find f of x. So f dash x means it's already been differentiated. If we want to do the reverse of differentiation, anti-differentiation, it is just integration. So I'm going to begin by writing it in the standard form that we would expect. We have an x to the 5 over 3 divided by x to the 1 over 3, which is just an x to the 4 over 3. 
Now this is an x to the half, right? So this is an x to the half. I need to do an x to the half divided by x to the third, which means you're going to subtract those powers. And a half minus a third is a sixth. So it becomes minus 2x to the sixth. Now if I want to find out what f of x is equal to, it's just integration. So I'm going to begin by increasing this power of 4 thirds by adding 1 onto it, and that will become 7 thirds. Remember, if it's a fraction, we can just multiply by the reciprocal. And for this next one, I'm going to increase the power from by 1, and a sixth plus 1 is 7 sixths. So I'm now going to have to multiply this by the reciprocal of 7 sixths. So that's minus 2 times the reciprocal of 7 sixths, which is 6 sevenths, and that is minus 12 sevenths plus c. Now, if you had the time, you can just check this, differentiate it, and it should give you this. Very quickly, you can see that 12 sevenths times 7 sixths, the sevens will cancel, and you do get the 2 for this part that you're looking for. Now, they've told us that f of 1 is 5 sevenths, so I think we should find out what f of 1 is equal to. f of 1 is when we substitute 1 in place of x. Well, that's just going to give me 3 sevenths minus 12 sevenths plus c. In other words, we have got that f1 is minus 9 sevenths plus c. So that tells me that minus 9 sevenths plus c is equal to 5 sevenths. So c is equal to 5 sevenths plus 9 sevenths, which I think is just going to be 14 sevenths, right? 5 sevenths plus 9 sevenths, which is 14 sevenths, which is 2. Hence, we can now say what f of x is equal to because we found that constant of integration, that, that c that we have. So I'm going to just take this equation that we have right here and just going to replace the c with a 2. So f of x is 3 sevenths x to the 7 over 3 minus 12 sevenths x to the 7 over 6 plus 2 for this one. Okay. Next thing we do is with definite integration, where you'll notice we have these numbers in the bottom and top part that we've got here. And I'm just going to quickly do this. This is um, Definite integration is sometimes called integrating with limits, so we'll have a look inside this blue box that we've got here. Now, if we're integrating something that has already been differentiated to f dash x, we know that it would integrate to f of x plus c because f of x differentiates to f dash x. But because of this a and b here, these limits that we have, we no longer have the plus c, and instead we write our answer with these square brackets, if I can draw a better square bracket than that one, and we put the b and the a like this. Now notice how they're on the left-hand side here, and then they shift to the right-hand side. We just get used to that. What you then do with the limits is you substitute in the top one into the function, you substitute the bottom one into the function, and you subtract them. So you do f of b subtract f of a. And if that all seems a bit confusing, this notation, You'll be familiar with it from doing it with some questions, and you'll see it in just a second when I do it um, on some examples. Now, I have got an exam tip here. You must show the examiner the process of substituting in the limits, even though a calculator can actually do this. You can type this thing on the left-hand side, or maybe I'll show you with this. You can type this directly onto your calculator and get an answer, but you do need to show the full process, including the substituting in with the limits, because there is a mark that is reserved for that. Okay, so let's actually dive in with this, just a bit of integration as well. Because we've got limits, we're going to be doing some square brackets this time. So I'll look at the 4x squared. I'll increase the power by 1, so it becomes x cubed, and I divide by the new power, or multiply by its reciprocal, which is a third. And then I'll do the same over here. I'm going to have the x, I'm going to increase the power from a 1 to a 2, and I will divide by that new power. So I get 2 over 2, which is obviously just one, so I can just leave it as 4 thirds x cubed minus x squared, and the limits are 1 and 3. So like I said over here, we will now substitute in 3 to the function and subtract substituting in 1 to the function. So I will substitute in 3, and this is the part I need to show the examiner. This is 4 thirds times by 3 cubed minus 3 squared, and from that I'm going to subtract, and I put brackets around this whole thing, substituting in 1 into both of those expressions. Now, once you've written that out, you could actually just put this thing here on your calculator and press equals, but it's a good idea to check this because then you'll know if you've got it right. And it's great actually that the calculators can do this because you can do it manually and then you can type it in and see if you've got the right answer. So that's four thirds times three cubed minus three squared. And from that, I'm gonna subtract a four thirds and a minus one. And we get the answer 80 
over 3. Okay, I just did a silly error. I started going through this question. I realized these limits didn't make any sense. So I'm just going to change them. I'm just going to say that we have a zero here and we'll have a four up at the top because when you had a negative down in here, you had to end up taking a square root of a negative, which obviously we can't do. So I'll have changed it in the PDF for when you're using it. So what I'm going to do is I will rewrite these so that they're in a more standard kind of form. Obviously that one stays the same, but this one is three X to the minus two like this. And then I will go straight in with the integration. So I will take the x to the half. I'll increase the power to 3 over 2. And I will multiply this by the reciprocal. Same thing as dividing by that new power. And that's 2 thirds times 2 thirds, which is 4 ninths. And then I will increase the power by 1 to minus 1. And I will do this either divided or multiplied by it because it's the same thing, the reciprocal or just dividing by minus 1. And we get plus 3. And that is going to be going between 0 and 4. Now, remember, you can differentiate this to check that it does go to this thing, which is always a very good idea. So I just need to substitute in the 4. So I'll show the examiner I know what I'm doing. That's 4 to the power of 3 over 2 plus 3 times 4 to the power of minus 1. And then from that, I'll be substituting in 0. Now, for 0, you don't even need to show it. You can just say it's a 0 plus a 0. It's pretty obvious. You're just going to get a zero for this. So on my calculator, I will just evaluate this side. So that is four ninths multiplied by four to the power of three over two plus three times four to the power of minus one. And we get one hundred and fifty five over thirty six. OK, so hopefully you got the same answer when you tried this. And like I said, I will have changed this in the PDF so that you have the same limits as me. Now this one's a bit different because we're going to try and find out what this value is given that we know the answer to the integration. So we're just going to work through on the left hand side and we'll get as far as we can and then we'll use the right hand side in a second. So I'm going to be integrating between k and 8. k is this constant that we don't know. Now if you're going to think about this in index form there'll be a 3 and we know that if it's a cube root it's to the power of a third and it's in the, in the denominator, so it's to the power of minus a third. So we're integrating that with respect to x. Now you might wonder, why is sometimes when I'm integrating, have I got brackets? And why have I sometimes not got brackets? Well, actually, this one probably didn't need brackets because it's just one term. But if you ever have two terms, you do need to have brackets to show you're integrating the entire thing and not just the first thing. So probably didn't require these brackets here, but I had them anyway. So let's actually do this integration. Square brackets, I'm going to increase the power by 1. Minus a third plus 1 is 2 thirds. And I'm now going to multiply 3 by the reciprocal of 2 thirds. The reciprocal of 2 thirds is 3 over 2. 3 times 3 over 2 is 9 over 2. And this is between k and 8. So I will substitute in the 8 to the power of 2 thirds. And then I'm going to subtract when I substitute in the k to the power of two thirds. So I can do this on my calculator, but could probably do it without because eight, the third power of a third is the cube root, which is gonna be two, and then two squared is four, but I'll check it anyway. So eight to the power of two thirds times nine over two. Yeah, we do get what I was expecting. So we get 18 minus nine over two, k to the power of two over three. Now we're gonna try and find out what k is because I know that this thing, is also equal to this thing. So I can say that 18 minus 9 over 2 k to the power of 2 over 3 is 135 over 8. So a little bit of rearranging. I'll do the 18 minus the 135 over 8, and I'll put the 9 over 2 k to the 2 over 3 on this side. So on my calculator, I should do 18 minus 135 over 8, and I will also divide that by 9 over 2. And that tells me that a quarter is k to the power of 2 over 3. So to find out what k is equal to, I can take the quarter, think about what you need to raise both sides to, to get k to the power of 1. We need to raise both sides to the power of 3 over 2. You could do it more slowly. You could cube both sides to get rid of this, and then you could square root both sides. But I will do it to the power of 3 over 2, and we come up with the final answer, that the value of k is... 1 8th. And it's good because 1 8th is in the range that we were expecting to have for that. Now probably the most common way you'll think about this is finding areas. Okay, and we're going to do two examples of finding areas. I'm not doing just a basic one where it's just finding the area underneath the curve because that's pretty obvious. We're going to look at two that are a little bit more thoughtful, a little bit more provoking. 
So to find an area between a curve and the x-axis, integrate using definite limits with the upper and lower bounds corresponding to the x values. That's basically just talking about trying to find the area between a curve between these values like this. This is your lower, this is your upper. We just use those as the upper and lower limits when we do integration. Now to find the area between two curves, which we'll do in this example, well, you're going to just do the integral of the upper curve minus the lower curve. You can actually subtract them before you do the integration with respect to x. And the limits that we have here and here will still correspond to the two places where they intersect each other. It will be very obvious when we do it with this example. Now you can do them separately and then subtract them, but you will find this is often a time saver, which is why I wanted to include this in this blue box. Now to find areas which are not with the x-axis, you may need to use other shapes to help you. I don't think I have one of these in this exercise, but I've seen them ask a question like this in the past where you're trying to find this area. Well, instead, what you can do is you can find the area underneath the curve like this, and you also have the area of a rectangle. So you could do the rectangle minus the red area, and it would give you the blue area. This isn't covered in my examples, but if you do find an area that goes below the axis, it will give you a negative area. And when you do, um, when you do mechanics in variable acceleration, you'll see that becomes quite important. So let's go in here. It says the finite region R shown shaded is bounded by the curves with equations y equals x squared minus 4x plus 10 and y equals 7 plus 3x minus x squared. Well, obviously, this green one here is the second one and the red one is the first one. How do I know? Well, this one's got the negative x squared, so it must be this green one. So we're going to find the exact area of R and it's going to be using this upper curve minus lower curve kind of um, idea that we've got here. But to do that, I am first of all going to need to find out what these two limits are about where it is crossing. So if I just put one of those lines here and the other line here, now of course we're going to have to use some algebra to do this. We're going to find out where these curves intersect. So I'm going to say that x squared minus 4x plus 10 is equal to 7 plus 3x minus x squared. Find out where they intersect. It's a quadratic, so I'll put all of the stuff onto one side. I'll add the x squared. I will subtract the 3x, and I will subtract the 7. And I'm just going to use my calculator to solve this, OK? So I'll go into my equation solver, polynomial 2 minus 7 and 3. And this is perfectly OK to do in the exam. You should do this. It tells me that x is 0 0.5 or x is 3. So we have a 0 0.5 here and a 3. So to find the exact area of r, I'm going to be integrating between the lower limit and the upper limit. Lower always goes at the bottom. And I will do the upper curve minus the lower curve. Now the upper curve is the green one. Okay, It's the one that's on top of the other one. So that is the 7 plus the 3x minus the x squared. And I'm going to subtract from it the lower curve, which is this one which is the red one, the x squared minus 4x plus 10. Close that bracket, close that bracket, dx. Maybe I can pull this down here so I have some space. And I'm going to say this is the same as integrating between 0 0.5 and 3. Well, let's see if we can just do this one at a time. We have the 7 minus 10, which is minus 3. We have the 3x minus minus 4x, which is 3x plus 4x, which is 7x. And then we have the minus x squared minus x squared. That is minus 2x squared with respect to x. OK, let's actually go and do the integration. So it shifts to the square bracket. That will be a minus 3x. There will be an x squared, and that's a 7 over 2. There will be an x cubed, and that is a 2 over 3. Notice I'm always doing the power before I do the number in front. And that's between 0 0.5 and three for this question, okay? So with this integration that we've got here, I'm gonna show the examiner that I know what I'm doing by writing this, but it's so long to do to type it into the calculator afterwards. So I've actually pre-done this one so that I could very quickly just give you the answers so that we're not gonna be wasting our time as we go through this. So we've got this one, and then we have our seven over two, 0 0.5 squared, and our minus two over three, 0 0.5 cubed, close the bracket off, you could type that all in. I've done it in my calculator to save time. And it's just 125 over 24. That is the area. If you want to, you can write that as units squared for this. OK, then the last one that we've got is kind of this more tricky one. It's defining areas which are not with the x-axis or using different like shapes between different things that we have here. So we're going to do it for this kind of question. 
it says the finite region R shown shaded is bounded by the x-axis, the line x equals 4, the curve with equation blah blah blah, and the line which is a tangent to the curve at the point 1, 3. So I'm going to add that this is a 4, I'm going to add that this is a 1, and that this is a 3, should that be useful for us. Find the exact area of R. Now, to, for a time saver, you would need to work out this yourself, but the equation of the tangent to the curve at 1, 3 is 2x plus y minus 5. Okay, this equation is 2x plus y minus 5. That would probably be like a part A of the question. My exam tip says, be expected to use other topics, especially differentiation within integration. Check the exam questions thoroughly as part of your revision. So I think the strategy for this, I see this as like a combination of different shapes, a bit like I spoke about earlier. I see it as we have this whole area here, but we've also got this triangle shape. Gosh, that was a bit of a large triangle highlight. We've got this triangle shape that can just be removed. So it's not going to be like the previous example where we can just do the area between two curves, because if it was the area between two curves, well, it doesn't actually have an area between. It's going to kind of come all the way down here as well, okay? And we only want it to be chopped off at the x-axis. So instead, I will find the area underneath the red curve, and I will remove the area of this triangle. So my strategy for this is I'm going to find the area underneath the red curve, which is my x squared minus 8 root x plus 10, and the limits for that are going to be between the 1 and the 4. So between the 1 and the 4, I'm going to be doing the x squared minus 8x to the half, because it's the square root of x plus 10, with respect to x. So let's do a quick bit of integration. That is going to be increase the power, divide by the new power, increase the power, and multiply by that power that we have there, or the reciprocal of that power. So it's 2 thirds times 8, which is 16 thirds. And then we get a 10x. And that is between 1 and 4. Now, of course, here I'm just going to say show the whole process. But I'm not going to do that just to save us time for a revision video. So what you should end up with when it comes into your calculator is 41 over 3. Literally substituting in 4, then substituting in 1 and subtracting them, and you should get 41 over 3. Now, the last part is to think about the area of this triangle. Okay, we're going to have a look at the area of the triangle. Now you could do it with integration, but why not just do the area of a triangle? We know that the height of this is 3, and we just need to find out if this is a 1, let's find out what this value here is. Now for that green line, we know that the equation, as I've saved us here, is 2x plus y equals 5. 2x plus y minus 5, excuse me, equals 0. So let's find out this value. This is when y is 0. So if y is 0, 2x minus 5 is 0, 2x is 5, and x is 5 over 2. So this value is 5 over 2, and this value is 1. So the length of the bottom of the triangle is 5 over 2 minus 1, and 5 over 2 minus 1 is 3 over 2. So the area of the triangle is the base times the height, divided by 2, or times by a half. So what's that going to be? 9 over 4, I think. Yeah, 3 over 2 times 3 divided by 2. That's 9 over 4. So the area of the triangle is 9 over 4. So we can now combine these things together and say, hence, the area of R is equal to 41 over 3 minus 9 over 4. 41 over 3 minus 9 over 4, which is 137 over 12 units squared. Just very, very quickly, just to talk through that strategy once more, we found out the whole area underneath the red curve between 1 and 4. We found out the area underneath the triangle, and then we subtracted it. And of course, we had to find out the equation of the tangent, but I did that as a time saver. You would have had to do that whole process using differentiation. So I hope you have found this series useful. There is one more video to come on it, which is exponentials and logarithms. Probably going to be the longest video because there's so much in that chapter. And I hope this is all useful for you. So I will look forward to seeing you in another video soon.